So welcome everyone to our webinar today on, um, on accelerating recovery and development through open science, building an agenda for a global information infrastructure. We're very happy to be holding this webinar in the context of the United Nations Science, Technology and Innovation Forum. Um, as I'm sure many of you will know, the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation in 2021 and the UN Open Science Conference in 2023, which we'll be hearing a little bit more about, have really underlined the need for a greater alignment and have pushed, shown the way towards a much stronger alignment of the sustainable development and the open science communities. Open science has the potential, as set out in these documents and these events, not just to be an accelerator of knowledge, creation, dissemination, sharing, and innovation, but also through this of wider development goals, of a faster recovery, greater resilience, and more inclusive, sustainable development. This is arguably a convergence in communities and ways of thinking that is long overdue. While the 2030 agenda, as agreed in 2015, does refer to the importance of knowledge transfer and access to information more broadly, there's plenty to do. There's no explicit references to open science, to open access in there. Nonetheless, open science, as said, done well, can accelerate innovation, can better ensure this inclusiveness and can facilitate science policy interfaces. Of course, this is a convergence that is taking place in practice on the ground. And that's really the goal of this session, to look at the work that's already underway in, among keynotes in that global information infrastructure libraries to make to, to realize the potential of open science as uh, of open science as a support uh, 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 as a driver of development and to recognize the potential of libraries as a part of the development infrastructure what we'll therefore do is start by having an overview of the open science conference the un open science conference that took place a couple of months ago and then we'll be hearing from leaders in the field in asia oceania in southern africa in europe in latin america i hope and they will share snapshots of their own experiences in supporting and overcoming challenges related to open science and its contributions and ensuring that it contributes fully to sustainable development. We'll then have a discussion exploring some of the common themes, the practical steps needed to ensure inclusion, the types of investment needed and what can be done to ensure effective science policy interfaces. We'll then hopefully look to get ideas from you to ask for your ideas, for your questions on how we can strengthen the information infrastructure for development focused open science. I'll very briefly introduce our speakers because I want to get on to them as quickly as possible. So I'm very happy to welcome Thanos Janakopoulos, who's the chief of the information management section in the Department of Global Communications at the UN in New York. We'll be hearing from Fiona Bradley, Director for Research and Infrastructure at the Library at the University of New South Wales in Australia. From Reggie Raju, Director of Research and Learning at the University of Cape Town Libraries in South Africa. From Susan Riley, who's Director of the Irish Electronic Research Library in Ireland. And then from Bianca Amaro, who's the General Coordinator of Research at the Brazilian Institute of Information in Science and Technology. I should have said at the beginning, my name is Stephen Weiber. I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Tamos to start by giving us some of that overview, setting some of the groundwork by giving us a summary of what was discussed, some of the outcomes from that discussion at the UN's own Open Science Conference a couple of months ago. Over to you, Tamos. Thank you very much, Stephen. And, uh... Thanks uh, to you, Stephen, and to IFLA, the International Federation of Library Association Institutions, for the invitation to participate in this event. Um, I want to thank everyone that is joining this conversation today. We had uh, a starter of this conversation yesterday, and I wish we will continue uh, the discussions today. I'm here to report on uh, of the work of the United Nations Dark Hammersker Library, which is the flagship library of the United Nations. Tatanos, would and, you be able uh, to turn your screen, your camera on? Oh, sure. We don't have you. <laughs> Everyone has to look at me, which isn't That's great. important. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> hi, hi again. So, um, as I mentioned, I'd like to report on the work of the United Nations at Hamaska Library, and in particular, the work of, uh, of uh, our work into open science, raising awareness of open science and uh, raising uh, the, the interest in the solutions that are available. Before going to say that um, 
the United Nations right to science has added a legal and moral dimension to a range of fundamental issues, including scientific freedom, funding, and policy, as well as access to data, hardware, and knowledge. Um, Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights clearly states everyone has the right freely to share the scientific advancements and its benefits. SDG 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals that uh, Stephen already alluded to uh, aims to enhance cooperation between different regions and countries, particularly in terms of access to science, technology, and innovation, and clearly states that we need to promote knowledge sharing on mutually agreed terms about science and scientific advancement. The UNESCO Open Science Recommendation, which was ratified by 193 UNESCO member states, is a unique instrument of collaboration which emphasizes the necessity of open science to achieve greater access to the benefits and the record of science itself. So open science does not come without policies at the international and national level. In this regard, and with a collab in collaboration with our colleagues from UNESCO and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, which is the department that uh, spearheads the Sustainable Development Goals Initiatives and mission of the organization, we have put forward the United Nations uh, Open Science Conference, which predominantly deals with, uh, with the open science suit of practices including, of course, open access. The conference has been running, the series of conferences has been running since 2018. And the, the, it has always been um, elevated, the, the principle of, and the need to reconfigure online repositories, library sources, and public funding to support scientific research and ensure the best results for all. Um, I think the main focus and actually the main, um, the main comment from all three conferences up to now was that science is not seen as a public good accessible to all. Relying solely on market-driven solutions or transformative agreements to achieve open science is not sufficient. Such approaches to scientific publishing of publicly funded research may benefit some actors more rather than researchers or readers, and may perpetuate existing power imbalances in the scholarly publishing ecosystem. Particularly in the last uh, and third United Nations Open Science Conference, uh, speakers and participants, there was um, quite a heated uh, discussion, which we were happy to uh, host and accommodate, um, emphasized the need for a more collaborative and inclusive approach to scientific research which can be achieved by embracing true open science practices, adopting inclusive publishing environments, using digital technologies effectively, supporting efficient peer review, the engineering, the engineering research assessment, and recognizing the contributions of underrepresented groups. I'll go into each point a little bit and say a couple of things about each of the points and then a couple of concrete actions at the end. Then I'll pass it over to you, Stephen, again. So again, embracing open science practices was seen as the essential step towards making scientific research more accessible and inclusive, and in this way, accelerate the uh, implementation of the sustainable development goals. Um, there are indivisible actions on the SDGs and there are indivisible actions within the open science agenda of practices. Researchers should make the data openly accessible, freely reusable and curated for the long term. This can be achieved by using open access journals, preprint servers and data repositories. By doing so, researchers can ensure that their work is visible to a wider audience, including those who may not have access to expensive paywall journals. The second highlight was the need for efficient peer review, which is an important aspect of this scientific publishing process that helps maintain the quality of research. A rigorous, timely, and ongoing peer review must continue to play a key role in creating and maintaining the public record of science. Individuals and organizations should support efficient peer review by providing training for reviewers using online platforms open 
to streamline the process and recognizing the contribution by improving the efficiency of being used, we of course understand that the scientific community can ensure the high quality of research. And of course, the fact that this high quality is recognized and shared with others. Equally important was the diversity that needs to be embedded in scientific platforms, platforms uh, <clears throat> and also in funding mechanisms and evaluation uses that will allow research communications to accommodate the different workflows, languages, publication outputs, and research topics that support the needs and epistemic pluralism of different research communities. The diversity may reduce the risk of vendor locking, which inevitably leads to monopoly, monoculture, and high prices. It is important to recognize and apply indigenous knowledge in Western science context, while recognizing and adopting the international resurgence of indigenous culture, sovereignty, and human rights building bridges between indigenous and Western culture and promoting equity and social justice in the process. Um, a more salient point that uh, actually ran through all conferences and of course was once again um, uh, highlighted and forward in the last uh, UN Open Science Conference was the need to adopt and create inclusive scholarly publishing environments in order to promote diversity in scientific research environments where everyone feels welcome to participate fully. Bibliodiversity, a term that was most welcome in the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation, is of reference and essence here, as is the need to decolonize knowledge. The industry of prestige, which is the research publishing industry at the moment that is represented by corporate publishers, does not serve science, science as a public good. Investment in infrastructure and support for non-commercial publishing to create a more equitable and inclusive scholarly publishing ecosystem remains necessary. The existing network of repositories, mostly managed by libraries, is a valuable existing mechanism, as are open source publishing platforms like uh, open journal systems, Janeway, preprint service, and so on, that can be utilized. Diamond open access will ensure that scientific research is accessible to all, readers and writers, regardless of the financial means. A collective approach to open access publishing that benefits everyone, regardless of the institutional affiliation or financial resources, will achieve larger equity. Caution was raised, was raised in the conference for transformative agreements, which have implications for libraries and open access publishing since they are not a proven way to transition the system from closed to open access. And they fail to address the diversity of the broad range of researchers contributing to the scholarly publishing ecosystem. They also do not eliminate article processing charges, APCs, and instead obfuscate them, creating a tiered access system to open publication for authors, potentially damaging individual careers and the integrity of the record of science. I will not endeavor into the article processing charging. I think I'm happy to ask any question, but I consider it as a main obstacle in uh, our uh, acceleration towards open science practices. Reengineering research assessment. Moving away from the industry of prestige towards a new research assessment, taking into consideration all the above. Initiatives such as DORA need to be highlighted. Publishing processes as are, they're essential, are essential for selecting out knowledge claims based on scientific methods and justifying what remains as good scientific knowledge. So peer review again is important. The current game, however, of general ranking impact factors and competitions, uh, competition has nothing to do with the knowledge and in fact gets in the way of maintaining the integrity of the record of science and raising obstacles to all. I think what happened with research about COVID-19 and this almost overnight opening of research um, is a good example here. Why do we have to do that? since that system worked fine, apparently did it. It worked fine when we actually brought down the paywalls and research would came freely available. Moving beyond the general publishing model into a network platform model would facilitate worldwide access to research as well as scientific publication for more diverse researchers. And the final point, it is essential to recognize the contributions of women as well as underrepresented groups in scientific research. Women in particular are underrepresented in many fields of science, but have made significant contributions throughout history. 
The same applies to historically marginalized communities. Individuals and organizations should recognize these achievements through awards or other forms of recognition. This could be achieved by providing mentorship opportunities for underrepresented groups, promoting diversity in hiring practices, and recognizing the contribution of diverse researchers. It could help promote diversity in scientific research and encourage more people from diverse backgrounds to pursue careers in science and democratize science. As we are increasingly living in a world where misinformation and disinformation about science is abandoned and freely available online, and I think AI applications are bound to bring new challenges of uh, deep fakes and misinformation, credible and authoritative scientific information should not be locked behind paywalls. How can we ask the people of the world to take action on the 2030 agenda or, or climate change or so many other societal crises that we face globally without empowering them with access to scientific knowledge? A couple of recommendations uh, that will uh, that sort of like will uh, surface more or less themselves is uh, we will work with uh, UNESCO to create a, a, a publishing, a guide for uh, sustainable scientific publishing. Um, the United Nations Dark Hammers Collective Depositor Libraries Network, which manages about 350 libraries in uh, 130 countries, uh, will uh, put forward the idea for a working group of libraries for open science, so we can push forward some suggestions and recommendations there. We will work with the IC, IC the International Science Council, to um, um, more or less clarify a little bit the need for effective and rigorous peer review. And of course, um, we will need to emphasize uh, the, the necessity to enhance equity also for indigenous systems and knowledge. Thank you very much for your attention and over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. And, and that was a, a fantastic sort of scene set almost. I was just looking through my own notes and sort of feeling that there's almost two sets of pairs of comments in there. So I think that firstly, the point that obviously open science is a policy issue because it's crucial, as you said, for delivering on the SDGs as a policy issue. But at the same time, it's also something that requires policy intervention. It can't just be left to the market. So this does need to be seen as something that, that policymakers own, that they feel responsibility for and that they actually push forward. And then I, I like to know, I, I felt coming up that, that firstly, the, the point you were making about clearly there needs to be a collective approach. There's not one single action. There's not one single initiative that will bring about open science, given the complexity of what's there and given that there's there's there are bad versions of open science or there are there suboptimal versions of open science and open access that don't provide the inclusiveness and so on. But then actually, I don't know, Actually, you, you can feel this is getting close to the, the logic that underpins the sustainable development agenda in general, the idea that we should be not leaving anyone behind, that we should be promoting an integrated approach, exactly as you said. And so, again, there's a circularity that we need to be able to apply sustainable development approaches within open science if we are to ensure that open science can contribute to sustainable development. Um, and of course, I know you, you, you mentioned it in passing, but obviously that's going to be one of the key focus, areas of focus here that clearly libraries do have a role in their support to researchers in, in actually turning efforts like DORA, turning other efforts, giving the recommendations, giving advice, running repositories, giving access. Libraries have this essential role in actually trying to make sure this circuit works, that these principles of sustainable development are applied, but then that open science itself can deliver on development. Which brings me to our next speakers. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, we have, I'm still trying to chase Bianca to make sure she's here, but this may give us a little bit more time for questions and answers if she isn't. But what I'm going to ask each of our next three speakers to do is talk a little bit about the current situation of open science in, in their, their country, in their region, and give a sense of, of how far at the moment we're actually managing to achieve that, managing to realize the potential of open science to support inclusive and sustainable development. So I'd like to start then with Fiona, who just as a reminder is the Director for Research and Infrastructure at the University of New South Wales Library in Australia. So Fiona, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a big thank you to IFLA and to the UN Library for hosting this event. I'm very happy to join you. Um, I am joining you from Australia, so I would like to begin by acknowledging the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm joining you from here in Sydney, Australia, and pay my respects to their leaders past and present. So to talk briefly around the current situation of open science in Australia, um, I will then also talk a, a little bit about what's happening in New Zealand and also more broadly in the Asia Pacific region. Um, in Australia, we have some strengths, but also some other areas where we really do need to catch up. Um, so to begin with our strengths in open science in Australia, we have two major government funders of research, the Australian Research Council, the National Health and Medical Research Council, which both have strong open access policies that support open access to research publications. Also, when it comes to sharing research, all Australian universities received government funding to establish institutional repositories around 15 years ago. However, what we need now is more investment to move to the next generation of infrastructure. Uh, we did have some good news recently that one of the other ways that we have good access to research is through the National Library that provides um, a, a service called Trove that makes our research visible to the world. And they have recently received some more um, secure government funding. It's very important to remember that um, Australian research is part of the global research picture. It's very important for us to make sure that our research is visible, not only locally, but around the world. Um, the Australian Research Data Commons has recently begun work on developing a national persistent identifier strategy, which is part of the technical infrastructure that underpins the way that research can be linked together between different systems, software, different kinds of output to make sure that everything is linked together. Apart from technology, we also have some good networks for sharing practice with each other. Um, we have Open Access Australasia, which has 31 institutional members across Australia and New Zealand universities and strong partnerships with national and state libraries, uh, citizen science groups, Creative Commons and Wikipedia here in Australia. We have a strong Australian Citizen Science Association, associations of open science researchers, research, research data commons, and most recently, all of these groups have joined together in 2023 to form the Australian Open Science Network, which also includes representatives from the major research funders and government departments. This is really important to bring together all stakeholders to discuss the need for a joined up approach. So those are our strengths, um, but some areas where Australia needs to catch up. We don't have a national open science policy yet, and we would really urge government to consider developing such an approach in coordination with all of the stakeholders I just mentioned. Uh, because of the way they're established, our major research funders actually cannot provide direct funds for open access publishing. So they can support in principle the way that open access should be achieved, but um, they're more limited in, in how the funding can be provided. Also at the moment, there is a lot of change happening in how research is being assessed in Australia, and we're waiting to hear the outcomes of what the future of our national research assessment exercise will be. Another area where we need to do more work is around issues of ownership of research, intellectual property, rights retention, uh, infrastructure investment and joined up policy so we can support the UNESCO Open Science recommendation, but also the OECD and other important documents. Some of the key issues in our region are, are certainly to do with Indigenous and First Nations research protocols, rights, data sovereignty and ownership. These issues are significant, they're very challenging, and they're generally not well recognised in the global publishing system. For example, it's very important that researchers are able to acknowledge and implement the care principles for Indigenous data governance. 
So a major challenge that we're working on is how do we make our research our methods, our results visible in the global research ecosystem while respecting that not everything can be open? This is very much an equity issue. So to talk also um, briefly about the, um, the broader region, um, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, in 2023, there was a pan-university statement on open access released, um, which also very importantly acknowledges the rights of Maori and other Indigenous groups to determine the appropriate avenues for their data and sets out how mem their member universities in New Zealand can pursue open access. Across the broader Asia-Pacific region, to begin, no doubt, um, the first challenge is to define what do we mean by the Asia-Pacific region. At its fullest extent, Asia-Pacific can also include East Asia, which means we're talking at about an enormous region with an incredible diversity of languages, economic development, and very different research systems. And all of these things um, have an impact on how open science can be progressed. In many of the countries in this region, there is still a lack of basic internet and computing connectivity. Yet at the same time, some of the countries in this region are among the most technologically advanced in the world. Uh, meanwhile, um, as we know, it is Freedom of the Press Day today um, at the UN, and many countries in this region do not have full freedom back that's access to information, which also has a major impact on access to research. Uh, there are some. Uh, there are many tensions in this region that have also, um, unfortunately, affected scientific collaboration and information sharing. Unlike some other regions, there is not currently a Pan Asia Pacific network on open science. However, there are some opportunities to explore such um, a group within some of the regional networks, for example, within ASEAN, to bring together countries that already have existing relationships. Um, most of the countries in this region, if not all at the current time, uh, do not have a national open science policy. There is a huge opportunity to advance such an agenda, as we've seen work very successfully in other regions. Um, one of the most uh, practical issues that we face in this region, of course, is that we span many time zones and our time zones make it quite difficult to participate in international initiatives, to learn from other regions um, and to travel. So certainly, as Thanos has also mentioned, there are many major issues around equity in this region. For example, um, with regards to access to research funds, uh, in terms of researchers having to publish in a language that is not their own language, um, visibility of specialist research topics and issues, and ways to foster effective collaboration. Also, which issues such as access to expensive shared equipment and resources. Um, and I highlight this because in the past we've seen occasionally efforts to try and duplicate uh, initiatives that have worked very successfully in other regions. Um, and oftentimes these haven't worked because what is needed for this region are our own solutions and our own way um, rep that recognise how Asia Pacific is different. Uh, just to mention very in conclusion, um, in terms of the UN agendas, there is a major contribution that open science can make to achieving the SDGs. Um, many years, well, some years ago now, this was something we argued for strongly in Goal 16 around access to information to make sure that it was acknowledged that it's not just about access to government information or official information, but also um, as IFLA itself um, acknowledged in the Lyon Declaration, it's much broader than that. It's And it's also very important and very relevant for open science to also consider connectivity, access to technology and skills. Um, in this way, uh, there does seem to very be a very clear and direct link between information, SDGs and open science. Um, there are also opportunities to measure access to information, open science within the SDG um, uh, metrics and, and monitoring frameworks. Um, whether that's uh, looking at um, SDG 16 or also um, Goal 16, which specifically called out the technology facilitation mechanism, which goes back to the Addis Ababa uh, action agenda, 
which also recognise the important role of open access to research. So in some respects, that uh, legacy has been there for some time, but perhaps we didn't have the language or the tools um, in 2015 to see how we could bring those two agendas together. But over time, it has become clearer um, and it has never been more essential to get back on track and identify how we can best pursue and bring together open science and the SDGs. So we are making progress in Asia Pacific. There is still more work to do. Uh, but it's very important work and I look forward to hearing um, everyone's ideas and suggestions on what we can do next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, and, and, and for giving that, that snapshot. I'm conscious that trying to ask someone to summarise Asia Pacific is, is an impossible task and, and not entirely fair. So I appreciate that you were sort of game in taking that on. I, I, I don't know, I think there's some of those, those points in there about the importance I don't know, of an overall policy approach and the opportunity that provides also to really make sure there's an adequate focus on questions of I don't know, respecting working with Indigenous groups, Indigenous interests, focusing on building on building on equality is important. And, and I think, thanks again, I don't know, that the underlining, this is hopefully something we get out of this session as well, is making sure that the open science and sustainable development communities really do come together as, as effective as they could and they should be doing. Um, so without further ado, I'd like now to hand over to Susan Riley, who's the director of the Irish Electronic Research Library, in order to give the perspective from Ireland and Europe, if you want to sort of make generalisations about large groups of people. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll try my best, Stephen. And uh, first of all, thanks very much for organising this event and inviting me to it. I think we all um, get so focused on developing our local solutions um, uh, to open science that it's always good to take a step back and, um, you know, look at it from an outsider perspective or, or explain it to people who are not local and also to hear how other people are addressing open science um, across the world. Uh, and especially because, as Hannah uh, said, um, collaboration is really essential um, in open science. Um, so I'm going to actually um, share some slides because it helps me <laughs> uh, remember, but also I think um, as you indicated there, Stephen, um, I'm not just talking about the Irish environment, I'm talking about uh, the European environment and um, it's easier to represent that via a few slides. Um, so, as Stephen said, I'm the director of the Irish Research eLibrary. I'm also, uh, I also wear another hat. I'm the chair of the um, Open Access Working Group in the Irish National Open Research Forum, which is really the vehicle for um, realising open science in Ireland. Um, so briefly, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my organisation. Um, uh, the commitment to open science in Europe, um, open research, as we call it, in Ireland, and what we've learned about um, inclusivity through the process of developing our open research uh, roadmap in Ireland. So I think from the outset, it's just it's important to emphasize that science or research is the foundation of evidence of the evidence based policy needed to achieve the sustainable development goals and um, the most effective way to to um, inform policy through research is by making that research open and I think that's what we're all here talking about today so IRL um, was established by um, university libraries in Ireland to support high quality research but um, through the provision of access to high quality research information. We're essentially um, uh, e-resources licensing consortium, or that's where we started out. We've been recognized as a essential research infrastructure in Ireland, and we support access to research and scholarly communications infrastructure to almost all universities in Ireland. Um, and we work within the context of Europe and, and our work on open science 
is really within the context of the European research area actions. If you're not familiar with the European research area, it's it, the aim of it is to create a single border borderless market for research and innovation in the European Union through alignment of policies and programs. So, of course, the alignment of policies and open science is an area of focus for the ERA. In fact, it's it's action one in the European Research Area Actions 2022 to 24. So to enable the open sharing of knowledge and the reuse of research outputs, including through the development of the Open Science Cloud, which is one of the European infrastructures put in place to enable fair data. In Ireland, um, we have uh, uh, Impact 2030, which is our research and innovation strategy for the country. And it really puts research and innovation at the heart of addressing Ireland's societal, um, economic and environmental challenges. Um, in other words, it, it relates to very clearly to the sustainable development goals as well and is echoed in, in the strategy. Um, and it positions aims to that re, aims to ensure that research um, has input, impact on public policy and implementation. And what's important for the conversation today is that in the strategy, open research is seen as something that drives the change in the research in research culture that is required to achieve impact. So open research is very clear out, uh, very clearly called out in our national strategy. Um, this. Uh, under our, I suppose, our, our research strategy, we have our national action plan for open research. And this was the strategy was developed by government. The national action plan for open research was bottom up and it was developed by stakeholders within the research sector. Um, the national open research forum was established in 2019. And um, work then began on a, an enormous um, amount of stakeholder consultation and landscaping to develop this national um, action plan for open research. And it outlines a national vision for a research system that's fully aligned with open research practices and principles. And the goal is to have this in place by 2030. There are three main themes in the um, action plan for open research. The first is establishing a culture of open research. Um, it's really important to change I think researchers' mindset um, and make open part of that mindset. Achieving 100% open access to research publications and enabling fair research data and other outputs. Um, actually, and I, I guess the thing to emphasize um, with this National Action Plan for Open Research is that it was entirely developed by stakeholders across the research sector, involving uh, representatives from all disciplines, um, all areas of the research life cycle. Um, and the action plan um, going forward is being funded by the government. So arising from the action plan are, are areas of activity or projects. Um, projects around diamond open access, uh, roadmap for persistent identifiers, research into secondary publication rights and rights retention, and the development of uh, an open science monitor, so a means to measure our progress. So IRL's, my organization's place in this, um, is uh, through the achievement of the goal of um, implementing a sustainable and inclusive course for achieving 100% open access to research publications. So in our consultation with stakeholders, it was clear that open access should be accessible for everybody in Ireland, not just researchers who have access to a grant or favouring researchers, say, in STEM, but actually um, the whole of the research community and sustainable. So it's important to manage the cost of open access. IRL is supporting transformative agreements and has been since 2020, and we do view them as successful, successful but not the complete answer to achieving open, sustainable and inclusive open access in the long term. 
We also support um, best practice in the use of persistent identifiers and we run the National ORCID Consortium. So we also think it's very important to, to monitor the growth of open access and we're investing in open science infrastructure through SCOS. We, we are also developing um, the National Open Access Monitor, um, which we hope to have launched by 2024. And this will help us to, to monitor that goal of achieving 100% open access. But what, what are we going to monitor? Well, first of all, we had to set out to agree a definition for open access. Um, there was no one agreed definition for open access in Ireland. Um, and so we conducted a survey of stakeholders um, who 97% agreed on the use of the BOAI uh, definition of, of open access. And the next step for us was to agree the what and the why of the monitor. So, so what sort of data are we monitoring? What kind of publications are we targeting? And why do we need the monitors? So mapping user stories. And again, this required a lot of consultation. So that is just, I suppose, one area of work under our National Open Research Action Plan. But what we've learned really is um, about inclusivity in open science is that, yes, we need a bottom up approach to, to developing a roadmap to achieving consensus, but we very need top down support to move forward. We need the funding from government. We need the policies in place. Um, rights retention absolutely must be addressed to um, ensure that open access publishing is inclusive because that's maximizing the choice for the authors and researchers. And we need to design for sustainability. At the moment, we're going project by project to build the infrastructure for open science, but we need to think long-term about how this infrastructure is going to be maintained when open science um, becomes the de facto um, modus operandi for research. So thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much. That that that, that was great, and it was, it's it's really encouraging to hear. You know, obviously, the themes that keep on coming up about the range of actions that need to be taken. That, that focus on monitoring is is really interesting. I think obviously echoes a point that Fiona was making about the potential. And it, this is an area where you can have indicators, and so it's an area that that fits in quite nicely with the, the broader approach taken with the SDGs that. You need to be able to set goals, you need to be able to follow in order to be able to ideally find good practices to share, to identify where to make progress on. So that's going to be really good to see. I know that some countries already have them, but it's really good to see this, this interesting, this process of how you're going about it in Ireland to, to, to get forward. And plus, obviously, this really strong focus on, well, is it lead? And if we apply sustainability within open science, but also how far is it supporting sustainability more broadly? And um, I'm going to hand over now to Reggie. Um, in order to get the view from Southern Africa, I, I think I'm not sure Bianca's going to be able to make it, but I think that gives us more time for, for Q&A later. And as a reminder, Reggie is the Director for Research and Learning at University of Cape Town Libraries. So Reggie, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Stephen, and, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, firstly, I must apologize for the business of my slides. Uh, primarily because I need to address the issue of my accent and my pronunciation. So I was trying to be as inclusive as you possibly can. Um, okay. I think uh, I'm gonna start the focus of my contribution uh, to this discussion is on the growth of the open access component of open science. The collection, curation, preservation, and sharing of research data is still very much in a fledgling state in Southern Africa and maybe non existent in many parts of Africa. When we speak of open science, the default is on discussions on open access with a high sense of commitment as the need to share is part of the DNA of an African. However, the opportunities to share are limited given the prevalence of conscious or unconscious bias. Geographic, 
and peer-reviewed prejudice and other biases. We are in a catch-22 situation where the will to share for the acceleration of knowledge production and innovation is denied. It is denied by these very biases. The opportunities to publish open is pro prohibitively expensive, severely limiting the opportunities to publish open. It is my posit that the way forward is to publish diamond open access. However, the technical skills for this is also limited. So as you could see, the challenges in Africa are multiple. As a librarian embedded in this diamond open access publishing is the reimagining of the role of the library. And here I've tried to, 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 to demonstrate, to show this. Here we're talking about instead of collecting from the outside for the inside, which is the current collection development practice, we need to collect from the inside for the outside. Collection development is not only for the user communities in our institutions, but for the world at large. This reimagining of the role of collection development opens doors for the accelerated sharing of African scholarship. Local or regional content can be openly shared to address the challenges of the region and other regions sharing similar challenges. We do not have to be politically correct to get published as long as the science is, methodo is methodologically sound. As pointed by Charlotte Rowe, when she used the field of economics, Global South researchers gravitate to publishing in US economics journals at the neglect, at the neglect of reporting on issues from their regions. The primary goal is to get published in high impact journals. And this seems the much less challenging route to take. The interventions conceptualized and rolled out in the global north to accelerate the move to open does not necessarily have the same impact for the global south. Let me share what I see as a significant negative impact of transformative agreements. The underlying principle associated with this intervention is the conversion of the subscription budget into an APC budget. For a large number of academic institutions on the continent, the subscription budgets are extremely small and in some African institutions be maybe non-existent. Hence, the APC budget will be correspondingly, correspondingly small. African researchers need the begging bowl now more than ever to get published. This begging bowl syndrome creates the ideal feeding ground for helicopter research. South Africa, which, excuse me, which hosts leading research universities is in a cul-de-sac. Transformative agreements gives us very, very little wiggle room. Relatively small subscription budget means small number of APCs and by default, limiting opportunities to publish open. We in South Africa have taken the concept of transformative agreements and converted that into what we are calling transformational agreements. We need to address the issue that access to research is critical for the production of research. Just to talk to a little bit more about transformational agreements. 
when South African consortia engages in negotiating with vendors, we default to transformational agreements. The central element of this negotiation strategy is targeted to re-engineering the publishing ecosystem. This re-engineering strategy is underpinned by social justice imperatives and have incorporated elements that nurtures and grows the next generation of researchers. We are looking at author development. In this transformational agreements, we are looking at author development, peer review development, and we are talking about negotiating uncapped APT, a, APCs. It is much more than just a finance issue. <clears throat> we have a, this strategy, this transformational um, agreement strategy right in parallel with Diamond Open Access Publishing. The University of Cape Town has developed a platform that encourages Diamond Open Access Publishing. Any academic or research institution in Africa can use the platform to host a journal or publish a book. One of Africa's greatest challenges is that of the lack of appropriate IT skills. This continental platform addresses uh, this challenge. Training is provided for the technical editorial processes of the books and or the journals. Training agreed to via transformational agreements, the training of, um, of, 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 of authors serve as, the, as a feeding trough for researchers and collectively we aspire to disrupt the model for improved opportunities to share um, our scholarship more openly. I'm going to use the last few minutes to share through one publication how Diamond Open Access is, how Diamond Open Access has embraced the principal concepts of equity. I'm not talking about equality, I'm talking about equity. Equity, inclusion, and diversity. I'm also going to show how this publication has addressed the social justice imperatives of the openness movement. This particular book is one of 25 books published by UCT libraries since 2017. What you could see here on the right hand side is the platform and those uh, countries that are in mustard or yellow or whatever color you want to see are countries that currently publishing on that continental platform. The book that I want to talk about is, is called Constitutional Law for Students. This diamond open access publication addresses the issue of equity, the issue of inclusion, the issue of development and empowerment. Of the 150,780 downloads, more than 100,000 is from within South Africa. And the other 49,000 is from the rest of the world, including the global South, the global North. As you could see here in this particular graphic, the global South is 75, the global North is 38, and the rest of Africa is 42. The, The significant number of downloads as reflected in this particular uh, graph um, is a clear indication of the freeness and the accessibility which conforms of this book, which conforms to the fundamental principles of the openness movement, free to the reader, free to the author with no copyright restrictions. But more importantly, and I think this is what we have forgotten as open access advocates, is the impact of this book on society, 
on the community that it is, that it is intended to address. The, a substantial number of black students, and here when I talk about black, it is Indian, African, and colored, um, who are funded by the National uh, Student Financial Aid Scheme. The limited funding for these students has forced students to make choices between the purchase of textbooks and other essentials such as food and accommodation. So I'm just toggling between the different uh, um, uh, um, slides here just to, to bring the point forward. As you could see here in this particular slide, for the period 2016 to 2018, the average pass rate was 14.4%. The pass rate post publication, and as you could see at the bottom of this particular slide here, in 2021, there were 58,000 downloads, and in 2020, there were 72,000 downloads. And you could see that the impact that this has had on the pass rate, there's been an exponential increase in the pass rate um, post the the, the, the publication of this book. The inference here drawn for here is that there is more than 120% increase in passage of the extremely needy, that is those black students on what we call NISFAS funding. Africa has its challenges and should not sheepishly follow the interventions conceptualized and rolled out for the global north. And I've shown by using this particular example that we can find solutions to our challenges. But by the same token, the global north needs to factor in the implications of their interventions on the global south. If we are committed to inclusivity, to equity, to diversity, the views of the global South need to be taken into consideration. We must stop playing lip service through this particular processes. Thanks, um, Stephen. Thank you very much. And uh, you, you just picked out the point that I, I was going to underline there that you know, it, it's a concept that does exist often within government policy making, the idea of an equity impact assessment and the degree to which a decision made is going to have a differential effect on people. But I know that's not necessarily done and may not have been consciously done ahead of moving towards transformation agreements as one model. And, and But I think also the point there, I know often these are decisions that I guess they feel like they're being taken domestically, but in fact, by setting a standard or by creating a model, they do inadvertently have an effect on what's going on elsewhere in the world, which again implies this need to take this global perspective and to take this equity impact assessment perspective. So um, we've only got 15 minutes left. So I, I had suggested three questions to our panelists, but I'm keen to give an opportunity to our audience to ask questions. I see there's already a couple of questions in the chat, I think mainly directed at Fiona for now, and I'll give the opportunity either to answer live or if you want to type answers, do go for it, Fiona. Um, given the limited time, I'm just gonna ask one of my questions um, and then hand back to, and then open the floor properly. And I think um, from an entirely sort of selfish, parochial IFLA point of view, I'm going to ask the one about what you see the particular contribution of libraries as being to promoting both equity within open science and then a help for, I don't know, a positive impact of open science on sustainable development more broadly. Um, I think Thanos has had most time to collect his thoughts, so I might go to Thanos first. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um... I just want to second uh, Reggie's uh, intervention, which I think is really important. And 
before going to answer the question, I wanted to uh, bring to everyone's attention a very interesting, I mean, perhaps you know these colleagues already, uh, I just saw this uh, last week, a very interesting um, research that was done by a group of people, uh, including Mr. Professor, uh, Assistant Professor Juan Pablo Alperin, which is called Recalibrating the Scope of Scholarly Publishing. Uh, what they did is they, they analyzed 25,600 plus journals uh, in the open journal systems. Uh, and um, they found out that these journals had uh, approximately 5.8 million articles uh, in 60 languages. And they were downloaded millions of times in 113 countries. Um, the majority of those journals coming from the global south but none of these journals indexed in Web of Science or Scopus. So um, I think this is a quite interesting article because it more or less speaks to the decolonization of knowledge. And uh, seeing this from the global perspectives, I, I'm consistently sensitized that when we speak about scientific access and access to scientific research, we need to keep it in mind that there are low-income countries, middle-income countries, uh, upper-level income countries, and high-level countries high level, excuse me, high income countries that sort of like this reflects on their research infrastructures and landscapes and access to information. So yes, that's the one I think. So um, going back to your question, what libraries You frozen for a um, minute there. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, okay. you froze so for a second. going back, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, going back to your question um, but, uh, about libraries and the open science suit of practices, uh, first of all, uh, I believe, uh, and I mentioned this in the meeting yesterday, that we need to understand that policymakers um, do not understand the complexity of open science and do not have um, a clear picture of what open science means. And it is uh, our role as library associations, as librarians, as uh, directors of libraries, to make sure that this is uh, becomes as clear as possible. This is communicated. Uh, it is our role to raise awareness of open science sort of practices. Open science is extremely important for libraries, and I believe that libraries are actually one of the crucial partners. And all you need to do is a partnership between a librarian and a funder, and that is going to be an instrumental uh, amount of, um, of influence that we can exert within the context of, uh, of so many policies. Um, just International Science Council has put forward uh, uh, six, I think, principles on scientific publishing. You know, the principles are there. We need to sort of like just pick up these principles and sort of like work towards implementing them. So raising awareness, building capacity, um, informing our library association that uh, we need to have libraries present in the voluntary national reviews of the SDGs. I think this is important steps as well as for, uh, you know, um, the frontline managers every day, we need to convince scientists to give their data. I understand their sensitivities and we will take in mind all the sensitivities, but we need to convince scientists to share their data. We need to store them. We need to see rep repositories as not just as, as dissemination tools, but it, it's, it, I think as, as in the words of Tim Berners-Lee, and I'm, I'm trying to write a little story about, a little article about this, um, see the repositories as social machines. You know, they're, they're not just there only for um, dissemination. And the work of COAR is, is quite, relevant here, I think, for the next generation, uh, institutional repositories and, and so on. So, thank you. Great, thank, thank you for that. I'm looking up the social machines quote. That feels like a really early instinct of angle to actually dig into and, and that idea of more active engagement. And I think Reggie's point about, I don't know, access is use. <laughs> the two go together hand in hand. Um, Fiona, over to you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And so um, uh, I think we won't have time to answer the q and I'll put some comments in the chat. But with regards to what libraries can do, um, one thing I find uh, always very interesting talking to researchers is that they're always um, 
really surprised and happy to hear how much libraries can help them with open science across the board. So we talk very often about access to research publications, but our role and our contribution has already been much broader than that. So one of the reasons why we do emphasize um, access to repositories and publications is because of our role in ensuring preservation of the scientific record, interoperability in bringing access together. But we also have that very important role in um, training researchers and supporting and building communities together with them. Um, one of the other things that's very important, um, Susan already mentioned SCOS, which is the Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. I'm the chair of the advisory board. And what we do there is we evaluate open infrastructure that libraries and other um, institutions can effectively crowdfund and provide some of their budgets to support. And that goes across all different kinds of services, whether it's publications, identifiers, uh, supporting research data, communities. Um, and, and all of these are essential to build a culture where sharing code and data and other kinds of outputs are, uh, become the norm and part of an international ecosystem. We also have a really important role in measuring progress, so helping to define metrics to uh, recognise and reward open science practices and report back on them. Um, in fostering bibliodiversity by being very uh, mindful about what we collect and curate and make visible ourselves. Um, and I would mention also the IFLA statement on open access that uh, uh, Susan and, and Stephen and I and, and others here, uh, also Richie, um, also participated in drafting that statement, which called out um, a number of these things to really highlight that um, what libraries do can cut across so many areas um, in open science. And what we're really seeking to do is help to build those partnerships uh, to make the work we do more visible. Excellent. Thank you. Though. Um, this is again, this is going to make my job at the end of summing up really easy <laughs> points here, which I can remember at this time of day. Uh, Susan, over to you. There is so much libraries can do and should I say are already doing now. So my experience in developing the National Open um, research action plan was that it was librarians really leading the way in terms of developing the plan. And what was great about those librarians is they really made sure that there was a diversity of voices represented. You know, researchers aren't going to necessarily engage with an open science platform. So you have to go out and talk to them and translate the value of open science to their work. And I think librarians are actually really good at doing that and trying to make open science fairer. Um, uh, I, I think also, to, you know, to get into those conversations, you know, with funders or policymakers to try and, again, translate what open science means um, in, in various contexts. Um, uh, so, for example, I guess if you're a librarian in a university and you're sitting on the university management team is to, you know, to make sure that open science is represented in your institutional policies or national policies. Um, and then the third thing is that we kind of do the thankless work, the invisible work in open science. So we put in place those infrastructures, those repositories for data. We support um, researchers to, to manage their data or their, their publications. We advocate for the use of persistent identifiers, the integration of persistent identifiers into systems so that open science is discoverable with all that invisible infrastructure that helps researchers to seamlessly embrace open science. That's where librarians are working and it's not seen. It's barely funded, um, but it's super important. Thank you. No, no, I, I think, yes, no, I think it, this is why we have events like this. So it's actually possible to underline actually all that huge amount of work that does go in and it doesn't, I don't know, it's the sort of thing you only actually recognise when it doesn't happen and things don't work, which is always the tragedy of these sorts of things. Reggie, over to you. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on the the, the comment that Thanos had made about um, the number of uh, journals that are published in the Global South, but do not appear uh, in the web of science. And I think this for me is the crux of the issue, is 
the prejudice that currently governs the publishing ecosystem. And in terms of web of science, the grading is a major barrier. Global South countries are graded much, much lower than global North countries. Hence, their research can be indexed in web of science. So those are the things that I think needs to be addressed. The, the barriers that need to be broken down. We seem to be jumping over the barriers and not breaking it down. And that for me is the challenge. In terms of what libraries can do, I think libraries, it's our business. The dissemination of information is our business. We need to take a lead role in this. The researchers are the consumers. So we need to take a lead role in trying to collect this, whether it is the data or the published output and make that accessible to the widest audience, widest audience possible. And as experts, we need to feed into policy generation. We need to take a stance and make the policy administrators understand that this is our core business and this is how we can make the change. And the example that I had chosen to share is was done deliberately to show by us taking this lead role, we can actually change our role as libraries and we can convert that into positive action that addresses more than just access issues. It addresses societal issues. We must not forget that open access should impact positively on society. And it's our role to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said, this has made it very easy for me to sum up. Given that we've got two minutes, I'm, I'm going to just run through what, what I think I'm, I'm sort of taking away as the, the key sort of recommendations there. And then I will give speakers a sentence each if, if you want this to add anything else or say to give any final words. I, I think in, in terms of recommendations coming out, a key one is obviously around advocacy and actually being the ones who actually stand up and talk and explain why this matters. and the fact that there aren't necessarily others who are going to do that. Um, the buck does stop with libraries, potentially with funders also. So th there's really that role in there. Um, I think there were both Ed and Tanos and Reggie really underlined that, that point about the importance of trying to rethink the way we deal with, we think about collections, we think about libraries into, uh, into something more proactive. And, and I like Reggie's diagrams of, how we need to avoid being inward facing and more outward facing. And Fiona also alluded to this, the fact of that what we actually want to do is give access to the work that's being done globally. Um, there's I don't know, points being made also about the degree to which libraries can actually help monitor what's going on, both from the perspective of putting together really useful metrics and, and giving a sense of how well we're doing, but also calling out things that are clearly going wrong, like. The, the the general absence of, of Global South journals in Web of Science and so on, because that's a bit of a canary in the coal mine when 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 this sort of work isn't actually getting in there. Um, highlighting those in um, the role of libraries, as Susan pointed out about the role of libraries as federators, as organisations that don't, I don't know, can take the lead and should take the lead, but also have I don't need to take the lead on their own are actually quite good at putting together coalitions and groups of people to make sure that all relevant voices are actually heard um and then finally again a specific role of libraries because there is this regular work with researchers this ability to understand the culture and I, I do air quotes there because that's, that's a big word but understanding the culture and actually taking necessary action understanding what action can be taken to change that culture because Culture is not immutable. Culture is not something that cannot change. Um, I hope that sort of broadly summarizes. I said I'd love to give each of our speakers a um, um, 
I'd love to give each of our speakers a, a sentence just to add anything or to give a final conclusion. There's been a question in the chat about whether it, our speakers are happy to, to share contact details. If, if you are, I recommend using the chat <laughs> um, for that one, if you're happy with that. Um, so just for any brief closing, brief closing sentence, Thanos. So I think um, libraries should continue to address the larger information management challenges, right? So we need we are addressing our operations, but we need to sort of be proactive with the larger global information management challenges. I think that is one that I would like to, to sort of like go down in history, so to speak. And also, uh, and I think this is really important because many times we talk, I mean, libraries contribute to goal, goal 16, uh, goal 17, goal. This is really important. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone that sort of like identifies this immediate connection with an SDG. However, the sustainable development goals are in, indivisible in nature and they are interconnected and interdependent. There is not one goal that I know where access to information is not important. So we need to keep this in mind to, to, to make sure like the moral imperative that you mentioned, Steve, of the sustainable development goals, leave no one behind. Okay, why do we have access to information? I think like scientific information, public information, citizen information, all sorts of information. And, and I think that's all that. Indiv indivisible in nature, interconnected and interdependent. And that's why access information is so important. Thank you. Absolutely. Fiona? I uh, completely agree with, with Thanos' comments there. And uh, yeah, so we live in very challenging times. And so reliable, open scientific information, data and code has never been more important, not only for open science, but also to solve all of those global challenges um, that we face. So it's important for us to remember it's not only about availability of information, but also about making sure that we can continue to build connections between institutions, ideas and people and make sure that we uh, keep the pressure on to also make sure that what is um, open and accessible today remains so in the future. Fantastic. Susan? Oh, sorry, couldn't get my mic off there. I feel like actually we're we're passing on a ball because I would continue on with what uh, Fiona's saying there. And yes, say keep the pressure on. I think there's renewed momentum around open science because of what happened during COVID-19 proved that it works. And um, we need to keep advocating for it. Um, uh, so yes, keep talking about open science, doing it and keep the pressure on. Fantastic. Excellent. And, and Reggie? Yeah, no, I think the, the colleagues have covered all the issues, but just one point, and that is access is as important as dissemination. Without dissemination, you're not going to get access. If you don't have access, you're not going to have dissemination. So some along the line, the chicken or the egg needs to be addressed. Fantastic. Yes. And, and I think... Exactly. I, I, so I'm, I'm not going to add anything to what everyone has said there because it was far more eloquent and, and articulate than I could ever manage. I just want to say thank you very much. I'm sorry we finished a couple of minutes late. I apologise for that. But a big thanks to, to Tanos, to Fiona, to Susan, to Reggie. A really a great session. I really enjoyed that. Um, we will post the recording up onto the IFLA YouTube channel. This will appear on our website um, as soon as I can get internet fast enough to upload that sort of stuff. But with that, thank you very much for your time and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the STI forum. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Stephen, and thanks to the colleagues. <laughs>